Ryan Stanton here with ASEP Front the Line, and uh, joined today by um, one of the uh, one of my favorite catches through uh, the Smack movement uh, here at Dot Smack. Uh, you heard an interview with her last year um, from uh, Smack Dub, and um, always a favorite from uh, from what I understand at all the Smack conferences because she she gets in there and starts messing around with your heart and soul and. Um, pulls it out stuff some stuff in it and then shoves it back in and and sends you on your way and i mean i think that's uh it's it, i yours this time your talk this time my wife and i were both in there uh, for the tuesday talk and um with that it's something that i think i've been struggling with i think that all of us struggle with but that inner voice that just sits there with a little pickaxe and starts hacking away at, at, at your foundation and you know where, where it hit me is right before I left Lexington, right before a shift, I get this communication about somebody that wasn't happy about something, and so I spend the whole shift perseverating on this little "what did I do wrong" and what the failure. And I think it, it probably affected it probably affected that care. And I think most of us are dealing with with that. And you know, I, I tell my supervisors, I said, please don't send this stuff right before a shift because I'll perseverate on it for two or three days um, before finally my my porous memory um, pushes it back somewhere deep with with uh, things like people's phone numbers and, and full names and stuff and I you know I feel like it's something that we need to address so let's start off Sarah Gray where uh, where are you um, what do you you know what do you do and and then we'll get into the uh, we'll get into uh, that inner voice, the voices in our head that aren't schizophrenia. <laughs> yeah, so thanks for having me. Um, I'm, uh, I'm from Toronto, Canada, uh, and I work both in the emergency department and in the intensive care unit there. Um, and here at, uh, at SMAC this year, uh, I was. I was talking about the voices that we all have inside our heads. Not schizophrenia, but uh, just how we can learn to hear our inner dialogue. And that I find for so many people who are in healthcare, our inner dialogue is uh, negative. It's critical or judgmental. Uh, and this affects us all day, uh, you know, as we're working and at home with our families. Um, and learning to uh, hear your inner voice and maybe change your inner voice for the better is something that uh, can help us perform better at work and, frankly, have, you know, perform better at home too with our families and our children what how much impact do you think there is i mean let's let's explain for those that may not have met their inner voice yet um or don't know that uh, what that is what is that inner voice and and what impact does it really have on our daily practice and i mean I, i completely agree i think even more so in in our home life i mean when i was doing um started off in a year of general surgery um, bringing that home my wife says you can you can continue general surgery but there's a good chance that they won't be with us together long term and so um, so quickly I, I changed my profession and so explain more of that inner voice and that impact it really does have on our, our care absolutely so um, the easiest time to hear your inner voice is when you have just screwed something up Uh, like just uh, spilled coffee on yourself or uh, tripped and fallen down in front of a group of people you know. Uh, And for me, my inner voice, you know, calls me names, tells me I should have been smarter. It's that inner dialogue saying, oh, Sarah, how could you do that? What were you thinking? Um, And the, the thing is, when you actually start looking at the evidence around how you treat yourself, it turns out that you're inner voice can make a big difference to your medical practice. So your inner voice can lower your confidence, it can increase your anxiety, uh, it can make your hands shake during a difficult procedure, it can lead to immune responses that are induced by stress. Um, But in general, it can make your performance during the day more difficult. and it can make your interactions with patients and everybody else uh, more difficult. Well, you, you even mentioned in your talk the, the kind of that intellectual capital 
you know the amount of the amount of decision making capacity and things you have in your brain and you know the way i like to think about it is you know in my particular case when i get those voices um, that inner critique it takes my eye off the ball so instead of being focused on the pitch i'm trying to look somewhere else at something else or, or a case that's happened um a long time ago and i think one of the things that really hit home is is that and, and it's it's what's really good about this the smack conferences it's education through stories and you talked about you know your your case where you're in the uh you're in the icu and and your your new clerk page is overhead on a you know difficult airway is there anyone in the hospital with airway experience come help and you know and i i understand that to me in the emergency room it's like when you know the nurse or the family hits the code button and everybody from the hospital comes down and says who needs help we don't usually come down here are you okay and so so tell us more about that a little bit about that story and and how that kind of translates into that uh that uh, mental decision making and mental capacity uh and i think we call it the uh, you know we, we talk about more and more often now that those distraction decisions and there is a limit to the number we can make absolutely right and so the thought about you have a certain amount of processing power or a certain amount of bandwidth uh, and if you're using half of your bandwidth fighting with the voice in your head or replaying a fight or a difficult interaction you just had you only have half of your bandwidth left to be looking after your patient or listening to their story or resuscitating them and so on this particular case Uh, We had had a very difficult airway in the ICU uh, that we were having trouble getting. And it was on a patient who I uh, had really um, felt connected with. Uh, And so it it was a very personal thing for me. And I found while I was resuscitating, I was trying to focus all of my attention on her airway, but still having this running dialogue in my head uh, of my inner voice sort of criticizing me or judging you know me in real time and then when I, I had asked for a second doctor to be paged to come uh, to come help me uh, but yeah my, my clerk who was new uh, rather than just paging my friend did put out this overhead page to my entire quite ginormous inner city uh, trauma center um, which uh, which we never do in our in our culture in our hospital like there's it's very rare to he- hear an overhead page, particularly one like that, asking for anyone with any airway experience to come uh, to the ICU. So about 50 doctors, uh, give or take, came rushing in uh, to help, all very alarmed. But that sort of social scrutiny only tends to make the voices in our head louder. You know, we feel more judgment and shame when that happens from that social evaluative stress. And uh, and so while you're calling for help on one hand, you're also in some ways narrowing your own bandwidth uh, by increasing those feelings of judgment. It was uh, it was a bad day. <laughs> and we've all had the bad days. I mean, it, you, not only then you have the voice in your head, then you start then you start perseverating on the voices in their heads that are talking about your you know, the voices in your head or about you. And um, so I think we've we've all been there, but now now hopefully everybody who's listening understands at least is aware of that voice and the power of that voice because I think that's the biggest thing is not only does it make you second guess I mean it changes completely can change practice but more importantly can take your focus off of that patient that's sitting in front of you at the time uh, but you you gave some great information on how you can manage or or help to deal with that uh, with that voice and um, you know some of those I've I have implemented uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute but talk about what folks out there can do to help with that voice as it may wreck your day yeah so um, I think one of the keys to uh, making your inner voice more helpful is learning about self-compassion um, which is just the the skill of being kind to yourself treating yourself the way you would treat a friend uh, speaking to yourself the way you would speak to a friend um, and for me I got a lot of really fabulous uh, resources from Kristen Nev- Neff's website her website is selfcompassion.org and I, I have no affiliation with her. I don't know her, but she's a researcher in the U.S. who sort of is a devoted body of work to self-compassion. And her website is just full of 
it's full of resources. Uh, it's full of books you can read about self-compassion or self-compassion exercises you can do. There are uh, people who are interested in meditation or mindfulness. There are self-compassion meditation exercises you can do. Uh, and that for me was a really great resource when I first started thinking about this to then branch out and and try to figure out what was going to work for me because I think you need to individualize it to your own personality type but I realized that I needed to get better at self-compassion to help work more effectively with my own inner voice. And I feel like that at least with the of course it's not like we've you know gotten deep mind meld or anything like that but just talking with you the, the two interviews that we've had and listening to your talks I feel like we probably got the similar personality type that and more instead of that type A regimented very militaristic it's more of that um, more emotional driven but also which can be good uh, connecting with folks but also can be very harmful in that it turns back around in terms of that um, and so I, f- I feel that a, a lot I think a lot of people can take some of that criticism and things and just you know water off the duck's back kind of stuff you know as for me it kind of sinks in and plants and I think that's one of the challenges is that in the administrative environment where we live right now you know many times these administrators who with a goal of improving care and safety and satisfaction and market share and things like that are constantly either dropping little bombs or, or planting landmines out there how do we protect ourselves so that we've got our a game when it comes to work with our with our patients yeah, and so I think, I think physicians and really all healthcare practitioners uh, need to have a wellness strategy. Um, we we all need to spend time figuring out what makes us healthy and happy, and then make sure that we're booking those things into our calendar. And that includes, you know, enough time to sleep. Time. We've got us. Uh, we've got us a truck. A diesel truck that is actually backing up past our tent at this very moment. And so we're going to break our train of thought. Just enough time for this thing to move its way by because we've got a pretty good setting today with not a lot of folks out here, but apparently they are working intently on something in the field behind us. And so, you know, having your own personal wellness strategy is important. Um, And so for me, that's things like trying to make sure I get enough sleep trying to make sure I get enough exercise, booking time uh, in my week just to play with my children uh, and sort of make that a priority. I find we tend to be very good at booking work into our calendar and protecting those times, but I think we need to book in time to let ourselves recover and replenish our reserves and protect that time in our calendars just as vigorously as we protect time for our shifts. Now, one thing, and I'd mentioned um, my wife before, um, because of something very important that you listed, kind of towards the back end of your talk, and that's, you know, I think one of the one of the strengths I have is that my wife is a physician and can relate to. So she is what you referred to as my failure friend, you know, the person that I can share stuff with. And so, tell us a little bit more about failure friends, um, especially with physicians who tend to feel like this is a solo sport and the importance of having that person um, that can help you through some of these situations. Yeah, so, and I agree with you. I think physicians are not very good at um, talking about their difficult cases. Uh, And so I I encourage people to find what I call a failure friend. Uh, Different people might like a different term for that, but really this is just your go-to person that you talk to when you've had a difficult case. And you don't need to talk to them about, um, you know, the the medical details or really worry about your your local uh, confidentiality laws. The goal is to talk to them about how you feel. And and for them, you know, to reach back in towards you and say, you know, I've been there too. We've we're in this together. So you have to choose them wisely. You have to choose a failure friend who is, you know, who is capable of empathy, who is kind, uh, preferably who likes you, um, and ideally, you know, who understands the context or why you may be having, uh, you know, such a strong emotional response to that case. Because when we 
stay silent around these cases that leads us towards burnout, uh, towards mental illness. Um, and identifying, like actively identifying people who you know you can talk to around difficult cases in advance makes it easier to then go to them and talk about a case. And as soon as you talk about it and you have someone say, oh, I have been there too, you start to feel a little better and you start to feel a little less isolated and you start to feel a little less ashamed and you start to recover sooner. Well, I feel like you, you know, when you get there, you have that person that you just, you can spill it out. And there's so much, there's so much catharsis associated with just getting it out there. So somebody else knows how you feel and that something's, that something's hurt you. And, I, you know, as I say, with medical stuff, it's, it's my wife. When it's, you know, personal stuff, it's this friend I've had since, um, since college and you know you, you mentioned uh, in your case you've got your 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 one uh failure friend uh, you mentioned two two different failure friends but then of course as a mom you have your three failure friends uh, because um i think for many of us that's probably the uh, hardest part of of any given day absolutely i mean i um I love my children dearly, uh, but I find being a mom is, is certainly my hardest job. Uh, I often find it harder than my work life. Uh, there is no manual, uh, and I don't get to go to rounds and conferences that constantly teach me how to be a better parent. Uh, so I need several failure friends for parenting uh, because, uh, yeah, they help me make it through. Well, and as a medical professional, uh, as a, and I think moms with this struggle a little bit more than dads. Dads are like, I kept them alive today, and people congratulate you just because your children didn't suffer a life-threatening injury. But with a, you know, with a with a mother, um, and especially a medical professional, I think women set that bar so high for their children, and worry about every little thing. And you know, and I see that here in in Berlin, walking the streets, and you know, Donna concerns about other children that are a little bit too far from their mother or or safety and you know and and uh, we actually talked to the uh, girls yesterday and they were about to go over to a um, friend's house and and when she got off to the got off the phone she's like well I hope I educated them on not being in rooms alone and with people and all this other stuff and so you know I, I see that constantly and I so I think that's uh uh, having those those failure friends and people that you can share with because I think for her you know that um, that knowing that other people have similar uh, have those same concerns and situations and that you um, are having similar type stuff to people throughout the throughout the world um, and it's not just your challenges with uh, with with your children and so I completely uh, I can completely relate to to that one and so uh Sarah, thank you so much uh, for the time. Again, fantastic talks, and I'll be uh, hunting you down once again uh, the next year, wherever wherever we may be. And then um, how can folks get, uh, get in touch with you, email, uh, social media, whatnot? Yes, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, I'm at EMICU Canada. Um, I suppose I'm the same on Instagram, uh, or I have a website, sarahgray.org. People can track me down through that. And mention that website one more time for that uh, that uh, wellness and, and information you talked about. Yeah, the, the self-compassion website is selfcompassion.org. If you just Google self-compassion, you'll probably find it on the first page. And one thing I love to see is the fact that medicine, it seems like we're finally starting to have concerns and focus on physician um, and provider-based wellness. And you're seeing that really take off with um, you know, ASAPs with, with their interest in the wellness weeks and things like that. And I think this is part, going to be part of that, that, that self-awareness and knowing that, that we are still human and we're fallible and we need to look for resources in order for us to be there for our patients because, you know, we don't want to have everybody burned out and out of medicine when uh, we need that, uh, we need that uh, intelligence and that, that capital there available to take care of our patients. Because as we know, um, both of our countries, the, the numbers are the numbers in need right now with the aging baby boomer population is growing. And uh, so they need all of us on the, on the front there to help take care. And uh, as for me, contact me, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. Also follow along at Everyday Med on Twitter and, of course, the ASAP Frontline page on Facebook. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline. <laughs>